We're starting a new series today called Soul Renovation. Let me ask you this question. Are you ignoring your soul? Let's talk about that today. We are starting a brand new series today, and it's called Soul Renovation. We live in a world where sometimes we are seen as only what we can do for other people, and it often feels very transactional. We're defined by what we do. It goes something like this, like I can make money for your company, therefore what I am is a money maker, or you're my child and I feed you and clothe you and provide a roof over your head and I take you to your practices and to school and therefore I am your provider. I shop at your store, I make money so I can buy your goods and services, therefore I'm a consumer. Or uh, I have skills and abilities. I, I've been trained in school to perform certain tasks for you. Therefore, I am a worker. Or like this, I buy tickets to your game or your concert. Therefore, I'm an attendee. Or I, I learned how to play this sport really well and I practice and I'm coached and I work hard and I compete at a high level. Therefore, I'm an athlete. There's this transactional component to all of those things. I do something for you and you do something for me. We get rewarded for the things that we, we do, the things that we accomplish, the services that we provide for our companies or our families or for other people around us. We get rewarded in money or in accolades or in adulation or something that even feels kind of like love sometimes. And that's just how the world works, right? We're to provide value for other people around us. But the thing is, we can begin to believe that that's all we are that I am a provider, a worker, a consumer, a parent, or an attender, and that's it. But here's the thing, and this is the problem for us, and, and this is why we are gonna do this series called Soul Renovation, because all of those things, being a provider, being a consumer or a worker, all of those things can be done without scratching the surface of who you really are. Uh, we can, and we do, define ourselves or let other people define us by those things on the outside of us, what people see, what others experience with us. But the truth is there's a lot more going on inside you and inside me. There, there's so, so much more to you than just being a consumer, a provider, an athlete, a student. You are much, much more than this and, and you know it. Maybe you've ignored it, but deep down, you know this is true. The Bible speaks to something else, that you're more than just a combination of your strengths and weaknesses or your physical body and what it can do or your value to other people. You have something called a soul. This is a reality that, that ancient writers talked about all the time. It was accepted as a fact that there is something about you that is deeper and richer and with the potential for great, great impact and deep connection with God and with people. It's something powerful, with the potential to do great good or great harm. It's a concept that the world overlooks, but if we're going to talk about spiritual things here, if we're going to grow and be people who are pursuing God, it's something that we cannot ignore. And so in this series, we're going to talk about what a soul is and why we should explore our souls and what difference it will make to do this in your life. And it turns out that the answer to that question is a lot of difference. We're gonna talk about whether we can point our souls in the direction of God, and if so, how do we do that? And what will that do for us if we do? The Bible talks about our souls a lot, and there are three places I wanna point us to today as we begin to explore this reality. And as we're reading these together, I want, I want you to ask yourself, what does this mean for me? Why is this important? Have I been neglecting my soul? And let me interject this here. If you're saying to yourself, I, I, I don't see how this is really relevant to me, Gerald. Like it seems like something a super spiritual person would talk about and that's just not me. I would ask you to just hang on and maybe suspend your judgment because what I think you're gonna see is that there is nothing more relevant. There's nothing more important than how and in what direction your soul 
is formed. And in that way, this might be the most important message series we've done or will ever do at Love Lake Norman. So, so hang with me on this. The, the writer of the Psalms, which is a collection of poems and songs in the Old Testament, digs into the area of the heart and the soul and the inner life a lot. In fact, the Psalms speak so often and deeply about the soul that, that often the soul is, is seen as almost a separate entity, almost like another person. And as we begin exploring what our souls are and what they're like, here's what Psalm 42 says about that. It says this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My my tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? And so, so right here, out of the gate, we find out one of the most bedrock core truths about our souls. Our souls long for God, like a thirsty deer who's been running through the forest and the fields and is tired and spent and looking for water. That's what our souls are like without God, dry, parched, thirsty. Your, your soul needs water. Your soul gets thirsty when you're away from God. And, and then the writer goes on and says this. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I, I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Your soul, he's saying, it can be poured out. It can be shared with others. It can be poured out to God. It's, it's active. It's, it can grow and change. And then the psalmist talks to his own soul almost like it's another person. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He's giving his soul like a pep talk. He's giving his soul some encouragement. He's like, come on, you know, soul. Like, well, why are you so bothered? What's got you down? Put your trust in God. No matter what is happening, put your hope there, not in anywhere else. And he concludes the psalm like this. He says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan the heights of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. That's from Psalm 42. The the one thing I want to point out here is that phrase. He says, "Deep, (coughs) deep calls to deep. There's a depth to your soul that you were almost totally unaware of, but it is there. We live very often on the surface of our lives, but but like an iceberg where there's 10% above the surface, 90% of it exists below. Deep calls to deep. It's the idea that the deepest part of me, the deepest parts of me are longing. They're, they're, They're calling out to the God of the universe who created me, longing for connection, longing for a relationship with him, longing for this greater reality. And, and whether you feel like a deep you know, person or you're feeling pretty shallow today, the truth is you are deep. Your soul has a depth that I guarantee you have barely scratched the surface of. But as your soul goes, it's how your life will go. And there's no doubt about that. Jesus spoke about the soul, of course. Like he, he, he was always most concerned with people at this level. He, he knew that the stakes couldn't be higher when it came to people's souls. And listen to his words from the book of Mark. He says this, he says, it says that he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. And he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And he's saying, if, you're, if your life is only about you, then, then not only is that a bad way to live, but you'll actually end up losing the very thing you want most to save, yourself. But if you're willing to give yourself up for me and for the truth that, that I'm sharing with you here, you will gain it all back and then some. And then he says this, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? He's, he's saying, compare the two, the whole world, versus your soul. In a world where it seems like everybody's trying to, to like gain it, to gain the whole world with all of its money and popularity and power and fame, Jesus gives us this extreme clarity. Why would it matter, he's saying, if you gained all of that stuff 
if in the process you gave up your soul? And then he takes it even further. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? It's like he's saying, hey, is there anything as valuable as one human soul? What you do with it matters more than anything else. And there's another place, one more place in the Bible I want to point out today, though, uh, like when it comes to your soul, when it comes from further back, like much, much further back, deep into the Old Testament. This picture we're painting of the human soul is, is ancient. Moses, writing to his fellow Israelites, he talks about the soul in this way in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, only be careful for yourself and watch over your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. Deuteronomy chapter four, verse nine. Watch over your soul diligently. It's what another version says. Above all else, guard your souls. He says this because he knows that there's a truth about our souls and it's what all of these verses have hinted at and it's this, your soul can be shaped and not only can your soul be shaped and formed into a certain shape? Right now, your soul is being formed. Author Dallas Willard, who was one of the most foremost thinkers in this area that we call spiritual formation, he says it like this in his book, Renovation of the Heart, which by the way, I would highly encourage you to read. He says that everyone's soul is in the process of being formed. And here's, here's what he writes. He writes this, terrorists as well as saints, are the outcome of spiritual formation. Their spirits or hearts have been formed, period. Their spirits or hearts have been formed, terrorists and saints. Choose wisely what you allow to form you, he's saying. Choose wisely what you allow to form you. Guard your soul. Every awful human predicament and problem that we find ourselves in around the world can be traced ultimately to spiritual formation because we become like what we allow to shape us. And what we are shaped like determines how we act. We are all formed by something. Friends, parents, families, schools, philosophies, spirituality without God. Choose wisely what you allow to form you because you choose whether you want God to form your soul, to shape your soul or your heart or your character or not. But what is your soul worthy of? That that thing that is forming your soul other than God, is it worthy of your soul? So let me ask you some things here today. Here are some questions to consider as we start thinking about the soul. Are you aware of your soul? Do you know that it's there? As we're discussing this, are are you becoming more and more aware that you do in fact have one? You do in fact have a soul. Here's another question. Do you understand the value of your soul. Do you know how much your soul is really worth? Jesus says it's of infinite value and worth to the Father. And then this question, what is forming your soul? What has the most say-so when it comes to this in your life? Your friends, spirituality but without God, social media, or, or, or God himself? The good news is this, God wants to form your soul and he has given us tools to use that do that. It's not mysterious, it's not chaotic, it's not random. Allowing him to form your soul, to shape who you are, to like through the life and the presence of Jesus, to make you into his image. It's simply the most important thing you can do with your life because it's what will determine more than anything the kind of person that you are. And in these next few weeks, we're going to dig more into what the soul actually is and talk about ways that you can connect with God so that he can do this important work in you. Let's pray. God, thank you that you give us depth, even then when we don't feel deep. Even when we feel like life is, is all about what's on the outside or what other people's expectations of us are or what other people think about us or the labels that they put on us, God, you say no. We have a soul that's been created by you that has depth and uh, a spiritual connection with you. We have a soul that, that longs for you like a deer pants for water. We have souls that uh, get dry and parched when, uh, when, when we feel disconnected, when we are disconnected from you. And God, you want to have a deep connection with us at that level, that you want to form us and shape us 
So God, right now, would you just help us to recognize that, yeah, you've given us a soul. You've given me a soul. Let's start to scratch the surface of what that is. And God, would you shape and form us into who you want us to be? Would you make us, God, more like Jesus? We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. The army's gone when the darkness falls by the depths of the sea. When the waters rise, spread them far and wide, deliver us, set us free. God, you're bigger than all the enemy. Than me. You restore us, you're fighting for us to bring a victory. Yes, of our pride, all the things we hide, lay down everything. Cause in your majesty, there's eternity in your power you will say in your power you will say God go bigger than all so grateful that you joined us today. As always, we want to offer a next step to you. One next step that you may be interested in is going to our website, lovelkn.org. There you can find information about who we are as a church and you can find our connection card. Now, when you fill that out, it's a great way for us to get to know each other just a little bit better. Another great next step is giving. We view giving as an act of worship and a great way of aligning your life to the mission of this church, which is to help people find and follow Jesus. You can find information about giving at lovelkn.org 
give. Last but not least, another amazing next step would be to come see us in person. We meet at the Oak Street Mill every Sunday at 9 and 1030, and we would love to see you here. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you soon.